This is the No More OGs podcast. From controversial topics to creating financial freedom, we will talk to real people about real situations, providing real solutions, no celebrity endorsements, bringing you unfiltered discussions, dope interviews, and giving you the blueprint to create the culture that you will be proud of. So kick back, turn up the volume, and let's get to it. Here's your host, yours truly, Mr. Purpose on Demand, Mr. Retired 37, Mr. Tim Jackson. What's going on? It's your man, Tim Jackson. This is the No More OGs podcast. I'm your host. I am so, so, so excited to have today's guest. We got somebody in the building. Man, he's every time a Super Bowl has taken place for the last decade, this man has been a part of that Super Bowl in some way, form or fashion. This is a gentleman who I had the opportunity to meet through another business partner. And I had a chance to listen to him talk about what he does for a living, and it blew my mind. And listen, y'all, y'all know how I feel about courses. You know how I feel about people pushing courses. I, you know, I purchased hundreds of courses before, but this is one of those courses that I really believe will change your life if you put uh, the time, effort, and energy into it. Uh, I have a friend of mine who does similar work, and he's like, man, you know, I looked this guy up, and he's the real deal. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, we always got to look people up, right? Mm -hmm. And so without further ado, you guys, I want to present to some and introduce to others my man, Mr. Kevin Jennings of Government Cheese. Man, what's good, player? Yeah, thank you for having me. Man. Man, you came in from Miami, Florida, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. So, listen, man, we're going to get straight to the business because, you know, this podcast, No More OGs, you know, I don't really believe in the theory of the OG. Uh, I believe that every man and every woman needs to get a mentor, somebody that's going to pour into them, teach them what to do, what not to do, someone that's going to guide them along the right way. And I stumbled on you. Uh, at an event here in Dallas, some, a guy had an event here and I bought a booth or I actually partnered with someone. We got a booth and our booths were right next yep. to each other. And uh, <laughs> and I said, man, you know, you came in, you had all your stuff, really super cool, laid back guy. But I'm, I'm a type of person I observe, right? I, I watch the room and I was watching all these different people walking in, kind of speaking to you like, hey, what's going on, man? What's going on, man? So I went to the booth and saw what you were about. I looked you guys up. And I said, man, this guy, he seems like he's the real deal. So tell my audience, man, who you are, where you're from, and, and what you do, and what your company's about. Yeah, for sure. So um, like you said, name's Kevin Jennings. I'm from Miami, Florida. Um, I got into government contracting in 2008 after the recession. So I was in real estate prior to that. Like, we all know everything went down. Mm. So we had to pivot. We had to figure out a way. So I got into government contracting. Um, once I learned the game of government contracting, I realized that it was so simple. But the problem was, was like, in our communities, like, nobody ever talked about it. We weren't mm. put on to it. And so for so long, people who had done it that looked like us were only in, like, the D.C. area. So up there, everybody knew about it. But everywhere else, nobody knew. So when I learned it in Miami and I started figuring it out, I was like, oh, that's it right here. And because I wanted something where I never wanted to have the feeling again like I had when I was doing real estate in 08, 09. And people were taking houses and banks were shutting down. I never wanted another individual to have that much control over my business bro and so i looked at the government like okay this is something that they always gonna spend money it's always gonna be there as long as you perform you're gonna get paid and uh so i started running it up man running up in government contracting and, and then uh like you said we met in in here in dallas it's so funny i actually created my course mm -hmm. the friday night before that event in no, the hotel oh you got to be kidding <laughs> You created, wait, wait, wait. So you nah, created your course I'm that night. It, so I'm assuming as somebody told you, man, you need to have a course so you can sell it on, on site, right? And you know who put me on the whole course game? And I, we're probably jumping far ahead, but Chris Bruce, Detroit Mogul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He He's the one that put me on the course thing. And literally, we started working on it in November. So that event was like early February. Yeah, yeah. Right? We had started working on it in November, but it, we didn't. Never finished it, it right? We never finished it. Yeah. I can't, he was like, you should come to this event and get a table and you can start promoing the thing. So I literally published the course that Friday night and yeah. then Saturday morning showed up and that was the first time I'd ever done any of that. But, um, but yeah, so I pivoted into the educational space because, um, it's, it goes back to, it's crazy what you just said about like no more OGs. Like we need mentors. We need people to show us how to do things and it's not a problem. And so that's what Chris kind of opened my eyes to. Right. He was like, bro, you should really start talking about what it is that you do because nobody really talks about it. Mm. He was like, and then the people that do talk about it, they don't talk like how we talk. So if somebody does go and listen to somebody, they're like, man, I'm not listening to this. And they... <laughs> <laughs> it's unfamiliarity, right? Like, yeah. like we're familiar. It's funny you say that because, you know, when you think when I think of an OG, when I when I was coming up, there used to be a code. Like, if you if you had promise, 
the old the dudes from the hood wouldn't let you get into certain things, right? right. On the flip side of that, you know, we, I had mentors and teachers and people who would see that I, I had promise as well, and they would say, hey, go in this direction. But you said something there. You said a lot of times there's people out there who are doing what you're doing, but they don't look like you. They don't come from where you come from. And so it's just not familiar. Yep. And you don't know if you can trust these people because you don't yep. really know them. But then, you know, a lot of people, they understand that they were meant to be great, but they don't see themselves in a certain area to be great. Yeah. So I think that with you, with what you're doing, you are kind of exposing a lot of people who would have never known about government contracts to this industry, man. Yeah, because it's so, like I said, when I, when I first got into it, it was the same way. It was unfamiliarity. So I was kind of like, oh, is this really going to be about something? What is it? But then once I learned it, and I'm like, oh, this is easy. So now when I try to teach people, I'm like, listen, don't be scared by the big words, by, yeah. the, by the long websites. And they do all of that purposefully. Barrier of entry. They set that barrier of entry so then that way you won't come in. And literally 80% of the people never make it past the registration. Mm. So it, it just, that's cool. They done did their job. But once I really learned the game, I'm like, nah, I got I to gotta show more people this. Because the government is the only customer whose budget increases every year. Mm. But the number of suppliers has been decreasing every year. Damn. So they're spending more money with less people every year. And you got to remember their budgets have to go up. Because if not, they don't get that much money, so they, they got used to lose it. Fiscal planning. Yeah, so, and, and the government... Oh, whoa, 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 no, we know, we know, we by that real quick. You said <laughs> they have to use it or lose it, and when people think government contracts, and we're going to talk about this, like, when he says he's a government contractor, like, delete what you think a contractor is and That's listen to what he's saying, 100%. because a lot of people think a contractor, well, I'm not physical with my hands, I don't know how to do this. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a person that provides a service to the government, and the government literally is the biggest person that is looking for servicers. Literally, they outsource almost everything. Yeah. So listen when he says a contractor. That's not you have to know how to build something. Uh, he's actually taught in his courses, and I've been on the calls where people literally just find a certain supply that a hospital, you know, a VA hospital may need 10,000 pieces of this one supply. Mm -hmm. You're a government contractor. If you can supply that, you can win that bid. And also, uh, they they have to have certain percentages of certain types of people on these bids. Right. So if there's a big job, they, they may need 10% you know, black or 20% black, or they may need so many female contractors. They may need so many African-American contractors. They may need a veteran, Veterans, right? Yep. You guys understand there's so much into being a contractor. As a real estate broker, I'm a contractor because somebody is contracting me to help them sell a house. So broaden your opinion and your thought process of a contract. Sorry, I didn't want to skate by that, man. Because I know people get super confused when you say but that, that, don't they? It goes back to the bare entry. They bare put these entry. terminologies on things, and then they've ingrained certain meanings in our own head. Yeah. So when we hear certain words, we think something. It's kind of like we, in the black community when you call somebody ignorant, and they think it's an insult. Ignorant just means that you just don't know. You just don't know. You have a lack of knowledge. But, but, <laughs> but niggas be ready to beat your ass. You call right. them ignorant. Right? And, but that's how it is. is yeah. they, they put these terms out there and they ingrain these thoughts in our mind. Yeah. And so that's exactly what they've done with government contracting. Or mm. the biggest one that I get when I try to explain it to people, the first thing they say is, oh, like war dogs. I'm like, yeah, kind of like war dogs, but I don't sell guns. I sell toilet paper. Mm. It's like same theory, but... That's what they put out there. And then even if you look at that movie, what's the whole basis of that movie? At the end, the guys go to jail. Mm. So it's like they put this whole movie out there that talks about what we do and then the ends the movie with, but don't do this because you'll go to jail like them. Man, and, th and that creates that, that situation where a person doesn't want to take the risk. They don't want to take the risk because in their mind, all they equate to is, oh, when them guys did it, they went to jail. Ah, you talking, man. You talking. So, and so that's that's honestly what I'm trying to do is just show people, no, it's not like that. You can't do it the right way. There is a lot of opportunity because the United States government is the largest supplier of goods and services in the world. In the world. In the world. And like I said, their budgets increase every year. Why? They have to continue to spend money. They're the only customer that actually equates for equation. I'm, I'm sorry, mm. inflation. Mm. So every year they take into account Cost of living and inflation, which see, is what was that four percent on depends, average? Yeah, four yeah. four to six percent. But they, typically, we see their budgets raise anywhere between eight to ten percent. It's funny because I, I I learned the four percent inflation rule because of Section Eight. Yeah, you know, because you can raise up if you have a Section Eight tenant, you can apply every year for an increase right. based on inflation. Mm -hmm. But see, people don't even know that. And I watch it, but it goes back to what the knowledge and 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 it's all there. 
but how many people actually read their Section 8? They just so happy that they got a Section 8 tenant. Mm -hmm. They just call it. It's going to pay forever. <laughs> yeah, and then they're happy getting $1,500 a month for the next 10 years, and they don't realize that it started at 15, but by the year 10, you should be getting 22, 2300. Easily. Easily. But they Easily. don't know that they, and so, yes, you're 100% right, but they, the government equates for that. Mm -hmm. And so their budget's continually raised. So we're seeing anywhere between 8 to 10% raises in their budget on an annual basis. But here's the crazy part. The number of certified small businesses has been decreasing by 3 to 5% every year. Mm. So they're spending more with less people. And it's and a problem. People always ask me, they're like, well, what's the problem? And I'm like, honestly, it's because of the generation. It goes back to literally no more OGs. Prior to this new generation... Businesses would be passed down through families, and there would be there would be even even if even our, in our minority communities, even if we weren't building that generational wealth like people talk about, and people weren't millionaires. But back in the day, you would go to the grocery store, and it would be this person, and then the son would be working there, the daughter would be working mm. the register. You see what I'm saying? And you would see that now. You don't see that. You you certainly don't see it within the black community. You don't like, see it. In our it's, community. it's almost. Uh, it almost doesn't exist. Like, you know, like with my son, I, my son, when I first started my real estate company, I got my son a name tag that said marketing manager. Yeah, <laughs> and then I, I had a stack of business cards. I said, everywhere we go, you need to hand out business cards. He took so much pride in that to the point where when I started asking him, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a real estate broker. I said, okay, I understand why you want to be a real estate broker. I want you to, to become your own person, but I do want you to be, I want to be able to pass my business down to you if that's what you want so that you can hire a general manager at least to keep it in the family. But you don't see that anymore. And that's no. why when you see people include their kids, specifically in our spaces, uh, in a, a part of their business, it typically goes viral because it's like, damn, you don't see that no more. People no. don't really bring their kids into the space. Yeah, and in the government contracting space, it doesn't exist. So what's happening is every year, the number of certified firms has been decreasing. It's turning over, huh? It's turning over. It's, 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 it's going down. And the crazy thing on the federal side, why we really have to pay attention to it is as the country progresses and we love our country and things change, well, uh, race is not looked at as a minority status anymore on the federal side. Mm. So there is no more black-owned certification. Oh, really? African American, not on federal. On your state and local, yes. Yeah. But as the country becomes more diverse... The federal government doesn't look at that. So, so what do they look at now? They look at small business, women-owned business, veteran-owned businesses, and then um, it's all based on social economic status. So, so wait a minute. There's no minority status no more? Not on federal. Not on oh, federal. Oh, that's crazy. So you can you can self-certify as a minority. Yeah. When you register in SAM, you click that you are of a minority classification yeah. as for race, but there is no certification that's given out for it. Because I, if I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, like back in the day, that's why you saw so many uh, black people working for the government because they had to hire so many mm -hmm. black or minority people. And that's yeah. why you look at D.C., so many black people living in D.C. that are part of the government or even at the post office, you know, like the post office, you know, it's like they made a push to hire a ton of black people back when my mother started working in the, in the early 80s. So now that's gone. So it's and it's crazy when you think about it. So they made that push. Right. Yeah. They increased those numbers. But now they 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 decimated that entire class. Damn. So now it's like in the 70s and 80s and even early 90s, they did all of that. And they said, hey, we're going to put y'all in position. But the problem with our community is they put us in position and we ain't do shit with it. Mm, no, now you can't say that out loud. <laughs> you know, you can't nah, say that out loud. Though, right? Now, you know, it's funny because well, the whole point of this platform is accountability, right? And that's what we got to hold ourselves accountable. You're right. We must hold ourselves accountable. But we have this thing within the black community specifically. And this, this show isn't specifically for black no, people. No, it's no. for the culture. It's for the culture. Um, but sure. I'm speaking about black people because I'm black. Specifically within our community, uh, we, we suffer in silence. Like, we have that, that mentality, like, don't snitch, don't say nothing. If something go bad, you either go take care of yourself or you just suffer in silence. And now you're starting to see, like, it's like an awakening taking place right now where people are like, no, nah, fuck that. I'm going to call out the bullshit. We got to say out loud that this is it's on us at this point. We have the game. We're getting the gems. We have the access. Now it's on us to stop being so passive about our wealth building and so passive about building our communities and so passive about, you know, passing this shit down to our, the generations below us and, and just talk about it without a person. Oh man, you talking down on people. No, I'm not talking down. I'm saying we need to, you need to get our shit together, man. Like, because jobs are going away, yeah. but the government ain't ever going nowhere. They're going to always need somebody to fulfill. Yeah. They're that always going to need. And so, yeah, so those, that, that, 
what used to be that black owned cert is is gone on the federal. Yeah. Now on the state and local, it still does exist. Depending, but, and it's based on the state. And it's based <laughs> on the state. And I tell people, that, I give people this example all the time. I live in Miami, right? A black or Hispanic person in Miami is not a minority at all. At all. <laughs> so in Miami, we don't have a black owned cert anymore. Yeah. Now if you go to Baltimore, Baltimore has a black owned business cert. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So it's it's as the as the whole country changes, all of these things change. They're gonna go away. So if we don't educate ourselves on how to do stuff, we will literally get pushed out of a market. And that's why I'm so passionate about government cheese is I want to bring the education to the forefront and let people know, hey, there are opportunities here for you. There's a lot of things that that can be done within the government space. And you don't, like we say, going back to what we're talking about, contractor, people hear the word contractor, they think construction. Yes, technically, I'm in construction, but a government contractor really doesn't have to do that. The simplest, simplest, simplest way that I tell it to people is that have you ever been to Walmart and seen a soldier in there buying toilet paper? Never. Never. But does that mean that they don't go to the bathroom on base? (laughs) <laughs> no, they do. They just don't buy the toilet paper from Walmart like me and you. They don't. They buy it from guys like me. Mm. And so that is a, being a government contractor. It's providing a good or a service to the government. And the government, they be wanting all kinds of simple shit. Like, like you said, toilet paper. I think you said uh, one of your homeboys did like some airplane parts. Yeah. Like he found it. he found airplane parts, and you showed him how to find the parts. And you say he didn't even have the parts. He just was able to, for lack of better words, drop ship it. You know, he the government agreed to to give him the contract. He found someone that did it. He, you know, there was a margin for it. He yeah. ordered it on his credit card, got all the shit delivered straight to them, and then they cut him a check. Yeah, the, the one of my best friends. He he started doing it. He started doing it during COVID. Yeah, um, he was in the aircraft uh, parts industry on the on the private sector, but then when planes were grounded across the world he yeah. couldn't really generate income selling aircraft parts so he got into doing stuff for the military mm-hmm. um it's a site called dibs d-i-b-b-s it's the defense agency's um their procurement site mm-hmm. and he started working on dibs he made a hundred thousand dollars selling duct tape yeah right <laughs> yeah, that's what you say was duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> he made a hundred thousand dollars literally selling duct tape to the military and so there's there's opportunities for everybody. The problem is is the access to knowledge. Let me ask you something. And I heard this, and correct me if I'm wrong. The military doesn't penny push either. Like if you have the service, you have the good. They need it. They just get it from you. They need it when they need something. They need something. Yeah. They're not. They're not. So the, the government works on a theory that they call best value. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to awarding contracts, everything's based on the best value. Now price can be a determining a determining factor for value. But it can be other things. It can yeah. be timeliness. It can be quality. Um, it can be reputation of the contractor. So everything to them is what do they deem to be the best value for the government? And price is not always the determining factor. Let's segue into getting into what you're doing now. I know a lot of people probably reach out to you like, how do I do this? How do I do this? Um, what are some of the, uh, the hiccups that you see that a lot of people have, specifically the people that never get it off the ground? Um, they quit. Mm, talk about that. And and listen, y'all, transparent moment. I bought the course. <laughs> but you got a lot going I, on. I went through the course. I <laughs> took it. I brag about the course like I got I got minute. So my homeboy that's actually a contractor, he's like, bro, you ever did you ever get all your shit done? I was like, nah, I'm interviewing buddy this week. So it's my <laughs> job this week to get all my shit. But like, y'all, I've seen like when I tell you my friend looked you up, he's like, What's his name? Let me look him up. Because you know, we are black yeah, folks always skeptical. Yeah. And when I told him, you you said you said, Hey, have him look up my company right here. We were in, in Florida. Yeah. And he texted me back, he was like, Oh, this dude legit, legit. You know what I'm saying? And that's just one of the companies, right? Yeah. 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 So so you said they don't start and don't get off the ground. Talk about that. Yeah, because so like we talked about the barrier entry. Yeah. So um, you've been through the course. You, you've been on the sites. So very Sam. simple Go, course. Very easy yeah, to navigate. I try to make the course very simple. I try to put it in terms that we can understand. Right. And then you have a weekly call, too. Yep. I yeah. do the weekly calls. And, and so that that way people are constantly getting that extra help. But the biggest. So the first area where people uh, stop is with the actual SAM registration. So they go on SAM.gov and they start seeing all these questions. Um, the government speaks in government jargon. So when they talk, they talk in standards and codes. So they have one that's called the FAR, they have the DFARs, the CPARs, they have all these different acronyms. Yeah. And so people start seeing all these things and these statutes and they just get scared and they stop. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one of the main things that we try to do through the course in the beginning is demystify all of that. Don't worry about all those funny letters and numbers. This is what it actually means. Okay. Um, so for the people that then make it past that point, 
Those people, once they get registered, half of them stop and quit because they don't want to put the work in. Because mm. I said this during my boot camp a couple weeks ago. Government contracting, it's not an Amazon store. It's not real estate wholesaling. It's not trucking. You got to work. This gotta is show a up. You got to show up. This is a process. Yeah. This is not something that you could just throw money at and buy your way through. Mm. This is, they make it hard because the government wants a certain type of person doing business with them. It's literally like basic training. It's like going <laughs> to the military. It's like it's, it's you got to create a discipline, right? And and I, I always talk about that is that one of the things that we lack these days is discipline. Like everybody wants to show up and win. And I can't blame it on any generation because shit, the people my age just want to show up and win. Same like when thing. I talk about, you know, hey, we were in real estate. We, well, I'm still in real estate. We flip houses. It's like, well, man, just tell me exactly what you did. Like, no, I, nigga, I can't tell you exactly. <laughs> Even if I tell you exactly what it I ain't did, gonna work. it ain't going to work that way <laughs> because you got to actually go do it. Yeah. And then the timing of everything, you might show up and do exactly what I did and you might get a totally different result Correct. because the times have changed right now, man. So they get the course. They don't get past the SAM ID. They get past the SAM ID. They realize it's a lot of work. What else? Then they, they realize it's a lot of work. They stop. They don't want to put the work in. They don't want to make the phone calls. They don't want to send the emails. They don't want to do the things because, all right, so when you are going to do business with the biggest customer in the world, mm. you have to elevate your business. It's true. And that's one of the first things we teach people is how do you level up your business to do business with the biggest customer in the world? A lot of people don't want to do the work. They mm. start looking at the things that it takes to actually do a business. And, if, and it kills me because when you think about it, Honestly, it's shit you should have been doing anyway. Like, you should have put a business plan together before you started your business. You, well, listen, you, you got chat, C, uh, chat GBT will do it right, for you now. Right, and that's the problem. And so these people rely on everything else, and they don't want to do the work. Ah, man. So then they quit. Preach it. So then, honestly, at the end of the day, you have about 10 to 15% of people that actually get started in government mm -hmm. contracting that actually get to the point to want to contract. I see you traveling all the time. You just came back from the Super Bowl, yep. and uh, you've done, what, the last 10 Super Bowls? Yeah, I've, I've been doing Super Bowl since 2010 was my first one. First so, time in Arizona, right? The first time was Miami. Miami, okay. Yeah, so Miami, um, my Super Bowl story is crazy. I don't talk about it a lot, but it's um, it's a dope story. I just The NFL is now, just this year, making me talk. Um, so they're, like, making me tell my story and explain what it is. But essentially, I took my certifications yeah. from when I got certified as a small and minority business in on the federal side and then I got certified with the state of Florida and the local municipalities. Um, when the NFL comes to different towns to do cities, they reach out to the state and the local cities to find small and minority businesses to come in and, and help because they have a diversity spending goal just like, Absolutely. just like the government. So they use the same certifications that the government uses. So that's how I originally got in with him was having that cert. And then me just being a hustler, like, you let me in the door, I'm going to kick it down. Like, oh, yeah. I'm going to run the bag up. So yeah. when they let me in the door and they showed me how things were going, I, I locked in with them. And I've been riding with them ever since. And um, every year, my role within the NFL has increased. And then this year in Arizona has been my largest role to date where I they gave me my own event to build that's and, and dope. manage. Which yeah. one did you manage? I did open the night. So it's the Monday night before the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, so that was my own event. I was the general contractor. I hired all the subs. I managed everything, all the coordination, everything that took place on that opening night from um, I worked with the architects in the city and the, the arena to put the design together, to do the permitting, then the construction, then managed it while the event was going on, then did the teardown and out. So it was Damn. pretty dope. And, uh... It, Dang, man, that's deep, man. Like, like, 10 years later, you're managing the opening night of the damn Super Bowl week. Yeah. Uh, did they give you tickets to the Super Bowl? Yeah, but I didn't end up going because I was moving too much. What? <laughs> so I ain't gonna lie. This dude right here said, yeah, but I ain't end up going. The number one game in the world, <laughs> he worked it that Monday by literally managing everything that took place. And then he has so much going on. Yeah, that, that's a flex and a half, man, to say I didn't want to go to the Super Bowl, man. But... You know what is funny because success, when, when you've been so successful over the years and when you've seen it, um, it's not as taboo as it is to some people, right? A lot of things don't excite you as much because your excitement comes from the next opportunity, right? So for me, what it was was that next following week, I had my in-person boot camp in Vegas. Yeah. And I was so focused on providing so much value to those 25 people that were coming to that event that for me, the Super Bowl wasn't important. What was mm. important for me was those 25 people that were coming 
to to learn from me in Las Vegas. So I was like, do I go to the Super Bowl? And I was like, man, I don't want to do. Let me just let me go to Vegas a little early. Let me start setting stuff up. Let me make sure that I'm providing as much value uh, to the world as I can. And so that's why I didn't go. You guys, that's what we talk about when we say you hustle for the the cake and not the cherry on top. A lot of people in today's <laughs> age, crazy. they hustle for the cherry on top, that's and crazy. it's like. They'd rather look rich but be broke. And it's like with me, man, I I always tell people I retired at the age of 37. Between the age of 30 and 37 was like literally some of my brokest years. Same. From the standpoint of I had no fucking desire to look rich. I had no desire whatsoever. I'll never forget. And I tell this story often on the podcast. I ran to my mentor who owns hundreds of properties. Uh, He brought me into real estate, uh, you know, in 2004, 2005. And I saw him at the cleaners. He says, I see you got a new car. That's the first thing he said to me. And this guy had the same 98 Lexus from the time I met him 10 years prior. And his thing was, man, you're hustling for the cherry on top, not the cake. Like every two years, you're getting a new car. Ain't shit wrong with getting a new car. But if that car is not the cherry on top, if that car is the actual cake, you're hustling backwards. You're supposed to be hustling for the shit that's going to buy you your car. Like your assets should pay for your car. And I, it was like that moment the light bulb went off like I'm doing this shit backwards because we've been taught for so long to be flashy and to show your money. But that's not wealth. You know, rich is not wealth. And, and being able to say, you know what, I did my job here at the Super Bowl. I had a great time. I've experienced as much time. But those 25 people in Vegas that need me, that that are trying to get where I'm at, where I am, those are the people that I'm going to focus on right now because I'll always have this opportunity, man. So, yeah. man, kudos to you on that. Well, let's let's segue into another topic, all right, or into another way. Um, let's talk about getting out your comfort zone because <laughs> I've known you for about a year and a half, two now. Um, you're not the loudest guy in the room. No. Nah, in, in fact... No. Um, if a person You can walk into a room They're going to notice you Because you're a big dude mm. But They're going to notice you More so of your presence And your demeanor Your quiet demeanor Because You, you don't You don't need to be in the room And be seen You just want to be felt From a standpoint of Hey I'm going to come in here And bring value to you um, This is what I do This is who I am Take it or leave it Talk about how Being that type of person How Transitioning into a person Teaching a course And transitioning to a person That's teaching classes now like how you had to like have to have to have to change who you were, so to speak, yeah. so that you can start providing value to other people and, and kind of putting aside your pride and what you thought, you know, was success versus what really is success so that you can show people how to get to, from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah, it was tough. And it still is. I'm yeah. not going to lie. Every day is a struggle for me because yeah. like I am so much of that person where I'm just to myself. I just be chilling. I'm not trying to cause super no introverted, scenes. super introverted. Um, but I realized that. I've been put on this earth to really do something greater than just me. And, um, and so once I realized that and I realized that it's more to it, I I was like, I just have to, I got to make the sacrifice and, and step out of my comfort zone and start to give because, um, it's crazy, but like we have resources and certain resources we look at and we don't realize that the resources cause to us is just our life. (laughs) <laughs> like the Super Bowl thing, for example, like we were just talking about, right? So, like, to me, going to the game, like, eh, it was like, it's whatever, because I can go every year. So, it's not Ooh. a big thing to me no more, right? But then I look at somebody else. If I take those tickets and I get them to somebody else who could never go to a it's Super Bowl. It's the best thing ever happened to them. Best thing ever happened to them. Yeah. Right? And so, that's how I looked at everything that I do now with government cheese. For me, doing what I do in government contract and running my business, it's just my life. I've been doing it for so long. It's not. The, it's nothing special to me. But if I can show somebody else how to do something real simple and it be something that completely changes their life and changes their family life, like I've done some good. So for me now, I feel like it's that greater good. That's 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 deep. Um, you know, sacrifice is, is is like what I've sacrificed in my life has gotten me further than what I could ever, you know, yeah. uh, accomplish. I always tell people I've made more money volunteering than I've ever made running an ad. Because when I show up to a place and I volunteer and I provide value, they naturally, hey, who are you, man? What do you do for a living? Oh, I do this, I do that. Oh, man, you know what? As a matter of fact, my cousin needs to buy a house. My, because they see my value. So I always tell people, like, if you're new to something, show up and just give a ton of value. That's crazy. And those people are never going to question who you are because you're showing up with value. Like, we're on the, we're on the 10 City Tour. I said this year I'm going to help 1,000 families uh, purchase their first home. Yes. That was my goal from the beginning of the year. I put up my own money, rent the venues, bro. I've only been to, I've had three events, Oakland, Dallas, and actually I do Sacramento in two weeks. From Sacramento, I go to Vegas. From Vegas, I go to St. Louis. From St. Louis, I go to Philly. But I've had people call me in different cities that's not even on the list like, bro, you got to come here. Because what you're talking about is real and people need to hear it. 
And it's like people I've never met in my life are like, I want to help you plan these events. Like, that's the value. I'm showing up to these events. I'm not charging people. They're coming in. I'm giving them a shit ton of information. And then on the back end, they can benefit from what I'm teaching them. And oh, by the way, I have something that's for sale for you. It ain't going to break the bank, but it's going to make the bank. You know what I'm saying? And people don't understand, like, just get out of your comfort zone. Like, stop trying to be the person that... That's holding on to all the information because you're you're not gonna be able to enjoy it, bro. Ever since I got into this whole education space, yeah, it's been that's been my people would say my biggest problem is yeah. because I give away too much free info. So like all the people that are in this space that know me, they're like, oh man, you can't be doing that. You got to do this, man. You can upsell this, and I'm like, man, I don't care. Like <laughs> I don't care about that. What I'm gonna do getting this? What I'm gonna do getting an extra five hundred dollars from somebody? Man, I don't care about that. So I I be giving up all the game, and people hit me all the time, man. You gotta stop doing that. You giving away too much. I'm like, no. No, let me give it all away and then let them see the value in what I'm saying and then come back to me and be like, hey, man, I seen the value in this. I think I'm ready to go to the next step. Let's talk about that because, you know, me and you, we've been in that same space with the course. Oh, so yeah. I, I bet you I know three or four of those people oh, that yeah, told you, you that. Know. But let's, let's talk about that because you already said something from the beginning. You said that 10 to 15 percent of people ain't going to make it anyway. So those 10 to 15 percent of people that do make it, they know your value. So, oh, shit, he gave me that for free. Now, when it's time for you to put on something else, they're going to be throwing their money at you. And people don't understand that. Like, that's how I am. It's just like, I don't like we had a, a credit course, right? Credit repair was like super big at the time. I, I started a credit repair business. I never felt good in it. It always felt slimy. I always felt like I was teaching people shit they should have been taught as a kid. Because when I would get around some of my other peers, they already knew this stuff. It was just black folks that didn't know it. Right. Mm. So I finally woke up one morning. I said, I'm never going to sell this course again. And I start giving it away for free. I'm talking about full course, hundreds of letters to, to write for dispute letters. And my friends was like, you are crazy, bro. I'm like, no, I'm not. Because at the end of the day, our goal is to get them into their first property. I'm a real estate broker. If they purchase a $300,000 property from me, I'm going to make nine grand. Yeah, why are you sweating $49? Why the fuck am I sweating a $49 course? <laughs> like, it's not even going to make any sense. But check this out. Many of the people that I'm selling their first house to, this is the very first time that anyone in their family has purchased a piece of property. So then they purchase the property from me. They're going to tell everybody in their family. Not only did Tim help me get my credit right and then charge me shit, but he actually put me in the house, my dream home. And, and now we're good. Now I'm at the housewarming party. <laughs> Five, six people are coming up to me. Can you help me too? Yeah. Well, now that 9,000 has turned into 45,000. Yeah. It's turned into 54,000. Yeah. All because I gave away a course that everybody wants to sell. Like, stop feeling like, not you personally, but people, somebody watching this, like, stop feeling like you got to be the be all, know all, and that your time is valuable, and people need to pay you your ass. Man, don't know, ain't nobody thinking about your ass. Like, seriously, like, get that shit away, give value, and drive them to the to, to what you're doing. And I promise you, you'll always have an endless stream of income because those people are gonna always fuck with you. They're gonna be your tribe. And if you put out a ten dollar course, they're gonna that's gonna sell out before you know it. And then you put out a twenty dollar course. If you have a free or a live event, then you can start doing those big events where hey, we're gonna be in Vegas. This is the ticket for it. But when you come, you already know what you're getting. You don't even have to sell that shit, bro. At, at my events now, it's so crazy because people come and they see the value. But by the time they leave on Sunday, they're like, you ain't charging enough. Like, I want to pay more. I'm like, nah, you good? <laughs> like, and that's what you call integrity, though, Kevin. Like, yeah. you're a person, you know, when a person doesn't, like, you don't need the money. Oh, you, can, you can go away tomorrow and never post on social media again. Man, I'll be fine. And you'll be fine. You will be in Colorado, <laughs> snowboarding. I'll be watching you out there uh -huh, snowboarding, yeah. right? Doing your thing, spending time with your wife. Will be able, what'd you say? She get the monthly purse? Yeah, she get a monthly Chanel. Yeah, a monthly. Uh, that, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're going we gonna to run that back. <laughs> His wife gets a monthly Chanel I'm a, for my wife. I know you're watching this, baby. <laughs> Pump the brakes. We're going out for her birthday tonight. But uh, you would be able to do that monthly Chanel every month and never have to post again because you've already created that value. But you're choosing to show other people because you understand the opportunity. And that's the difference between a person with integrity and a person without. A person without integrity will always see the dollar. Hey, charge them more for this. And that's not to say that people who upcharge don't have integrity. But what I'm saying is, when you come from areas where you've seen people struggle, then you see the value in giving them what they need. And then once they show you a little bit more, then you can give them more. And the greatest feeling for me is when I'm able to provide value to somebody and they can implement the skills I teach them in their life. Mm -hmm. And they hit me like, yo, I did this and it really changed or I was able to do this. And for me, that's like the biggest like that's that's worth more than any anything. I keep a folder in my phone that's that's essentially that all the time somebody has texted me or messaged me like how something that I taught them changed their life. And if I'm feeling like shit, 
I go straight to that phone. I'm like, nah, man, get your ass up. You're making an impact, bro. Like, the crazy thing with me is I, I get all of those things, and like people on my team, are like, oh, you got to post testimonies. All I'm like, I don't do, I don't want, I don't need everybody else mm -hmm. to see that this. Literally, when somebody sends me something, to me, it's like personal. Like you say, I keep it, I read it, I'm like, all right, cool, bet I'm doing the right thing. Doing the right Let thing. me keep going. Let me keep trying to do stuff. Let me see how I can help the next person and the next person. I don't do it for the world's acceptance. I don't do it for any of that. I do it to truly change lives and help people. Bro, you every time I've seen you, this is how I this is why I really rock with you. Every time I've seen you, man, you got on a black shirt, <laughs> some blue jeans, uh, you're not trying to stand out because you don't need to stand out. Your impact stands out for you. Yeah, I'm not. I tell people I don't I don't need to be the loudest one in the room. I don't need to be flashy. Do I like nice things? I love nice things, but it's just not me. At the end of the day, I'm I'm in a gas station T-shirt. Like, I'm the same dude. Like, I still go to the gas station two, three days a week and buy T-shirts. It's, it's not physically responsible, y'all. It's probably <laughs> not the smartest thing. But it's just who I am. I don't need all that design. Or I don't need all of that. I don't need that to validate me because at the end of the day, what people don't realize is you're not wearing designer to make you feel better. Mm. You're wearing it to make somebody else feel good about you. Shit. I don't need you to feel good about me. I feel good about me. I feel damn good about me in this gas station t-shirt. I don't need you to feel good about me. Putting on Dior and Louis Vuitton is not going to make me feel any better about me. Mm. What it's doing is make you feel a certain way about me. So if you don't like me for me and my gas station t I really don't give a shit. <sighs> like, damn. That's a that's 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 gonna be the one that we run. That's gonna be the one we run. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's real, bro. No, nah, and you know what? And, and I, I gotta tell you, man, I appreciate you. I want to tell you this personally. I was watching your post working out. You got me back in the gym. Yeah, man. It's but it's it's one of those things. I made a real conscious effort. And and while I rock with you so much, we have so many similarities. Like you say, you retired at 37. I retired at 38. Yeah. Right? And then I went through this phase where I was trying to figure out what the next step in my life was Bruh. and trying to figure out where I'm going all that. And so I really started working out more um, just this past year. I had always been working out like I always work out. I, I CrossFit and I competitively CrossFit. So I'm always in shape. But like just this past year, I was like, all right, now nah, if I'm be out here providing value to the world. Right. And I see the impact that I can have on people. I got to clean up my physical. I got to clean fact. up my mental because I got to be here longer. Because mm. if I can impact, like you said, if you can impact a thousand lives this year, okay, let oh, 2,000 next year, 5,000 year at that. Bruh. You see what I'm saying? But if we're not in that right mental and physical state, we can't do it. Now we had all this traction and we started helping all these people. And now we gone. Your body done shut down. Your body done shut see, down. see, that was another thing, man. I was eating so bad. Like, you know, I was Same. eating so good, but I was eating so Same. bad, if you know what I mean. And then once my daughter came, my daughter's six months now. It's just like, I got really bad asthma. Um, and then out here in Texas, our allergies are horrible. I'm like, man, I need to get in shape. I need to start working out. But also going out speaking, like, you want to look good in front of people. Like, people respect the person that's in shape. That's yeah. just statistically proven. But, uh, man, we're going to wrap it up on this note, man, because I know you got stuff to do. Um... You always bring so much value. I, you know, whenever I see you on a podcast, I saw your Millionaire Mindset podcast. Shout out to my guy, Xavier. Yeah, shout out to uh, I've seen you every time you post something that you're doing, I go and watch it. But uh, this is something that we do on every episode, all right? right? Uh, so the people who watch this know what I'm, where I'm about to go with this. My favorite movie, one of my favorite movies is Back to the Future, the second version, right? Where he goes to the future, future. And I want to ask you, and I ask everyone this, if you could go back and and have a conversation with 18 year old you you guys are walking down the long hallway it's just the two of you guys 18 year old you looks up y'all catch eyes he sees somebody familiar and you're like hey like let's talk i'm you from the future like what would you tell 18 year old you so 18 year old me i would tell him don't chase the fast money because mm. that's one thing i was doing at that age um i was so worried about getting it quick i was so engulfed in what could happen fast that I wasn't focusing. Mm. Um, and then I would tell them, start investing, start buying. Don't buy the Jordans every week when they come out. Don't do all that. You know, take that money. Every time you get $500,000, go buy a piece of land. Because, mm. um, and you would respect this being in real estate too. I messed up because in 2004, 2005, when I was, Chasing that fast money, yes. I was flipping properties and I wasn't thinking long term. I was living that Miami life. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about life when I'm 45. Mm. I wasn't thinking about my kids because I didn't have them yet. So I wasn't thinking all that long term. Um, I would tell my younger self, start buying stuff now and just sit on it. Buy anything. Buy a piece of land. 
buy 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 a small rundown house in the middle of the hood. Buy the house with that's boarded up, and you might not even do nothing with it today, but just let it sit there for a year or two, and then watch what happens. So that's why I would tell myself, slow down. You know what, man? It's funny you say that. Um, I always share my stories about houses that we flip. This morning, uh, somebody reached out to me. They Googled, like, real estate agent in Pleasant Grove. That's where I'm from in Dallas. And my name always comes up because we did a lot of business in Pleasant Grove. And so the guy was like, hey, I got this property over here. And I said, I know that area, man. Me and my wife, we flipped a house over there. We've done a few properties in that area. So I show up to the house. And this house, man, they own it outright. Um, the price they want for it is crazy because, you know, back when they bought it, back in the day, it was only like 15, 16 grand. Now, I drove around after the conversation. I went to the house, the, one of the houses that me and my wife flipped. We bought this house for 60 grand. We probably could have got it for more, less than that. And then we ended up selling it for, I want to say 130. It's a pretty decent flip. Mm-hmm. That house right now could probably sell for like three. Mm-hmm. Um, but we own that house outright. And my wife, you know, she we were going to live in it, but we ended up doing something else. And we bought several houses cash. But just literally buying and holding like a piece of property in that area five years ago, it would have multiplied by five by now. Just literally buying and holding. We bought and held one house. We paid 20 grand for it. I always use the exact same examples. Um, we had the house for three years and it, it tripled in value. In three years. And it was a completely gutted two bedroom, one bedroom house. I got the house. same situation. I bought, a, I bought a townhouse in Gainesville, Florida, right in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. I paid $25,000 for this townhouse. It's literally been empty for three years. Once again, not physically responsible, y'all. I'm not telling you leave the <laughs> house is vacant. But I could sell it now for one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. We did the same thing. We did. We left it vacant. Like my thing was, it is what it is. If somebody breaks into this house, they're gonna bring it to it. But I mean, we from that area. We know everybody over there. Anybody breaking this shit? Like they know us. You know what mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, man, I'm proud of you, man. Uh, you know, there's not too often where you get to see people. And I, I'm, you know, I, the way I grew up, man. You know, we were taught. The OGs taught me. Uh, you know, hey man, don't trust people. You don't know. Or if a person ain't from your hood, don't fuck with them. Yada yada yada. Like. There's so much flawed thinking that we were taught. I was taught. I can't speak for everyone. But when I get around people, they say, man, I did too. Mm -hmm. And the older I get, the more I realize that when you're getting, when you get into a room with somebody that's not necessarily doing what you're doing, but is on that same beaten path of teaching people how to become better versions of yourself, like stay connected with those people. Uh, And I made it a point two years ago. I always say bald headed Tim because I, (laughs) during the pandemic, I shaved my head, but I made it a point to meet people like yourself and just get to know them. like follow them see what they're about keep an open mind like not be too judgmental not say i wish they would do it my way like my way is not the only way to do things right and i'm so thankful that i you know i, I feel like everything happens for a reason and because think about how big that room was we were in was right, was right, we were right next to each other man <laughs> yep. and your business partner came over and bought a book yep. and i looked up and your business partner was reading the book i was like oh she really bought the book bought yeah. the book she done posted online i'm like okay they seem like real good people man then i start following you i'm like this dude's a good brother. He's a naturally good dude, you man. You know, one thing I really like about the whole internet and social media yeah. is that, like, I, you know, we all hate it for the bad things. Yeah. But we've all had that moment, right, in life where we sit back and be like, man, if it was just one more me, I'd be so straight if I could find another me. <laughs> and it goes to what you were saying. What I use the internet and social media for is I've realized that there is another me. There's another me in every hood in this country. Everyone. It's just before social media, I didn't know that other me. But now, like you say, like I'm linking with you, our stories are so similar. We damn near the same person. We just in different hoods. I'm in like, Miami. Seriously. You're in that. Seriously. seriously. But we would never would have known that if we didn't have that opportunity. So I just like you keep myself open in every city I go to. I'm always meeting. And so if I'm online, I'm looking for them solid people and I'm connecting with them solid people because now I truly believe, no, there is another me out there in another city. We got a different name. We might look different, but there's people that are doing the same thing. And if we all connect, that's how we really can make a difference. That's a fact. And, and what I tell people is that, you know, trust your heart. I trust your gut, not your heart. Your guts, your heart attacks and your guts fill through the bullshit. That's true. You know what I'm saying? That's so true. when you meet somebody, like, go with your gut feeling. Your gut feeling will tell you exactly who that person is. Um, and that person will reveal themselves over time. Don't don't get too emotional about attaching yourself to somebody. Like, matter of fact, don't try to attach yourself to somebody. But find that one thing about them that you can relate to and fuck with that thing, man. Like, stop trying to make people into you or to somebody that they're, they're not going to be because they're individuals, man. But, man, I'm proud of you, man. Like, keep up the good work. I, I really applaud you for what you do and what you're teaching uh, people uh, from all walks of life. But specifically for people that come from places like us who are literally starving for 
a response, an outcome, something different, and they can show up to your page and they can get it. So with that being said, man, where can we find you? Uh, so the governmentcheese.org is the website. And then on socials, it's a GOV underscore cheese. Okay. So we're all on all across platforms. And I just started the YouTube channel, which I'm happy about. Because now I get to put out more of that free content. So, hey, man. So, I'm getting big. I'm trying to learn YouTube. YouTube is an interesting beast, man. But, you know, I was taught by a mentor of mine. If you master YouTube, you can literally master everything. Yeah, because man. everyone comes to YouTube first. And then they'll go to your other location. So, I'm literally centering my stuff. Like, go to YouTube. Go to YouTube. And then in the in the show notes or on my page, it's like, oh, by the way, follow me here. So, yeah. man, I'm going to follow you on YouTube. Make sure you follow this guy on YouTube, too. Yeah. Because he's going to give you a wealth of information and knowledge. Well, listen up, you guys. This is the No More OGs podcast. I'm your host, Tim Jackson. You all do me a favor. Like, subscribe, follow, and share. Look at the show notes. Kevin actually has a course that I feel like you should definitely take a look into and seriously take a look into it. I'm starting the course on Monday. Y'all hold me accountable. Check back with me and see if I got my ID set up because it's it's a wrap. Like literally, this is the year where we are building wealth. I told people that I'm coming out of retirement. My goal is to retire again at the age of 45. But this time, I want to make a, a hundred millionaires before I retire. So I've already helped two people touch seven figures, and I've helped about 15 people hit six figures. So I'm on my way. Will you be one of them? Well, be sure to stay tapped in. This is the No More OGs podcast. We'll see you soon.